Hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good middle of the night, whenever it is that you happen to be watching this or listening to it. So today we're going to go over HIV and um, the list of what we call AIDS-defining illnesses, along with, we'll talk about Kaposi's sarcoma-associated herpes virus. So <clears throat> you guys probably already know that HIV is a zoonotic disease. So it's a disease that came into humans from animals. And I really like this quote here from um, the book Spillover. It's also in this smaller book, The Chimp in the River, which is about the zoonotic origins of HIV and how it emerged from a forest in Africa and became a worldwide pandemic that um, we may never uh, get rid of. <clears throat> but he writes that every spillover is like a sweepstakes ticket bought by the pathogen for the prize of a new and more grandiose existence. It's a long shot chance to transcend the dead, to go where it hasn't gone and be what it hasn't been. Sometimes the better wins big. Think of HIV. Um, I picked this quote, gosh, way back at the beginning of the semester when I was adding quotes to all of my slides. Um, but it also is kind of relevant to what we're going on with now. So COVID-19, the name of the disease caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, SARS coronavirus 2, um, is zoonotic in origin. <clears throat> So if you click on this link here, it will take you to a nature paper uh, that covers the likelihood of it originating in bats or in the pangolin. Um, and then this link here will take you to an Amazon link for the chimp in the river if you feel like reading more about the origins of HIV. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Okay, but let's jump in. Let me push the right button and then we'll jump in. Okay. <clears throat> Learning objectives for this lecture. When we are done here, I want you to be able to identify the important steps in retroviral establishment of latency and the provirus stage. So what parts of the viral replication cycle are important for the virus to remain in your cells forever. Um, to discuss current and potential ways <clears throat> and drugs to control viral replication in an infected individual. Describe the effects of cellular tropism on HIV-1 disease manifestation, progression, and pathogenesis. Explain the acute and chronic phases of HIV and AIDS with regard to symptoms and immune status. And then to understand the pathology of KSHV, um, Kaposi's sarcoma-associated herpes virus, also called a human herpes virus 8, um, and why we primarily see it in AIDS patients and not in uh, the general public as much. <clears throat> Okay, so back when we were actually going to meet for class, um, I had up on World Class, and the link is still there, um, a, uh, a link to the MMWR, or the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, from June of 1981. I realized that most of you, probably all of you, were not yet born in June of 1981. Neither was I. All right, so this all happened prior to, you know, all of us being alive. Um, so in this period of October of 1980 to May of 1981, there were some interesting cases occurring in Los Angeles. So five young men, um, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis urovetsi pneumonia at three different hospitals. Two of the patients died. In addition, all five patients had laboratory-confirmed previous or current human cytomegalovirus infection, and candidal mucosal infection. So this would be like thrush, um, fungal growth across the mouth and into the esophagus sometimes. Um, so if you click on that link, there's case reports for all five of these young men. Now we have already talked previously about pneumocystis urovetsi, pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP, um, and we've learned about cytomegalovirus. And we've learned that most people with a normal healthy immune response don't get PCP pneumonia. Um, and we've also learned that HCMV infection in most healthy adults uh, is either asymptomatic or causes a mild cold, maybe it causes mono at the worst. 
And candidus, or candidal um, species like candida uh, albicans, is a normal part of the human flora for a lot of people. And our bacteria, our microbiota, keeps it in check and keeps it from growing out. So these three diseases that should normally be asymptomatic or not happen at all appeared in five young men <clears throat> within a relatively short amount of time in one particular area. So this is 1981, right? This was weird. Um, this was something new. Uh, so if you read those five case studies, then this last little paragraph I've copied and pasted here. So diagnosis of PCP was confirmed um, by open or closed lung biopsy. Here's where it gets interesting. These five patients did not know each other and had no known common contacts and had no knowledge of sexual partners who had similar illnesses. Um, uh, all five reported using inhalant drugs, one reported IV drug use, um, two of them reported frequent sexual contact with a variety of partners. Three of the patients had profoundly depressed in vitro proliferative responses to mitogens and antigens, right? So they're not getting good re immune responses um, to mitogens, which uh, should activate the immune response. And lymphocyte studies weren't performed on the other two patients. <clears throat> this was the first tip off y'all that there was a new disease out there that we did not understand. Eventually, all of these young men were um, tested positive for HIV, but HIV had never been identified before um, in history until after these initial cases that kind of tipped the world off to something being wrong, something new being out there that we didn't understand and we didn't know how it worked. So if you're interested, go back and read that. Um, I was going to have you guys discuss it, but you know, it's kind of hard to discuss it when we're not actually in class. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay. Today, right, we're going to talk about HIV-1. Um, it belongs to the uh, family of the retroviridae. It is a retrovirus, and it belongs to the genus lentivirus. Now, lenti means slow. Because these viruses, HIV, they take, in general, a very long time for the development of really severe disease. So unlike an acute infection with something like flu, where you maybe start feeling the symptoms, you know, four to five days after you contract it, with HIV, with these slow viruses, it can be decades before the full extent of the virus kicks in. Each HIV individual virus has two copies of a positive sense single-stranded RNA genome. So it's a Baltimore Baltimore class six. Um, it is enveloped and it has a teardrop capsid. So down here is the two copies of the viral genome. They are surrounded by some protein that helps keep them safe. They come in with a couple of important viral proteins already in the capsid. One is the integrase protein, which we'll talk about, and the other is reverse transcriptase, uh, which is important for taking our RNA molecule into double-stranded DNA. Both of those are enclosed in the capsid, which has this really distinct teardrop shape. So if you look at the electron, micro, uh, electron micrograph over here on the left, you can see the teardrop shape in several of these individual virions. <clears throat> that whole thing is uh, surrounded by an envelope, and out of that envelope sticks 14, exactly 14 glycoprotein spikes per individual virus. And there are a couple of important uh, proteins that make up these spikes. You may have heard of GP120. Um, you may have heard of uh, GP40. So this single-stranded RNA virus, uh, its genome goes through a double-stranded DNA intermediate by the activities of reverse transcriptase. And then this whole thing gets incorporated into the host genome where it can undergo viral latency. And like with our herpes viruses and our other latent viruses, once it is latent, we cannot get rid of it anymore. Okay, so I am joined for the next few parts of this lecture by my daughter, Cora. You wanna say hi? Hello, my name is Cora. Um, if you hear me yelling, that's our cat. 
yeah, our cat's out the door. He is mad that he can't come in. Um, Cora actually last year sat through this lecture. Two of them. <laughs> Two of them, back to back. The one in this class and the one in my undergraduate virology class. So she's going to join me and she's going to interrupt and ask questions when she has questions to ask and help me discuss a few parts of HIV um, biology. All right. So <clears throat> when sorry, the cat's meowing. When um, people first started going back and looking to try to figure out where HIV came from, uh, there was a lot of work to find out that it was in fact a zoonotic disease, meaning a disease that came from animals and came into humans, also called a spillover event. And after a lot of work done by a lot of people, we actually figured out that the HIV one as we know it originated in this tiny little bit of land down here, um, in the southeast corner of Cameroon. So it's thought that someone here uh, picked up the virus, probably from butchering chimpanzees, where his blood mingled with chimpanzee blood, and then brought the virus in their body down the river. Or her. Or her, it could have been a her, that's right. Brought it then uh, down the Congo River to either Brazzaville or Kinshasa, which used to be called Leopoldville back when the Democratic Republic of the Congo was called the Belgian Congo. So then here in these two cities right across the river from each other is where the virus really started to take hold. You just let Dallas in. Yeah, just let the cat in. <laughs> That's where the virus really started to take hold and started spreading through the population. <clears throat> and so there were a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the first is, that there was a pretty burgeoning um, sex trade in these two areas. So people would take it, um, take the virus home to their wives, to their partners, to their spouses. And another was that in this time period, and, and we're talking about like the 1960s probably around in this time period, um, when vaccines or IV antibiotics were given, um, needles weren't exchanged. Oh, they just shared the same needle? Yeah, so they just would use one needle and give, you know, a hundred people a vaccine with that same needle. Oh, that's disgusting. That's pretty gross, right? And so that means anything that one person has gets transmitted to the next person. And since we're talking about a blood-borne virus, that's why um, it started to take root here. And then eventually it spread from Brazzaville and Kinshasa and made its way to port cities where it then went worldwide, right? So if we look, and I tried to find um, newer data, but this was the last total data I could find. If we look at how many people are living with HIV back in 2016, it's probably pretty comparable right now. You can see that in the darker the color from like our kind of yellow to red, the, the brighter the color means the more people. So the majority of cases of HIV are still in Africa. Uh, but you can see there is um, a lot in uh, Southeast Asia and a whole lot here um, in the Americas. Uh, it's something like 40 or more percent are just here in, in Africa as compared to the whole rest of the world. <clears throat> so the burden of disease is in Africa. Um, so that's for HIV-1. There are actually two types of HIV. There's HIV-1, which when you think of HIV, that's the one you think of, and then there's HIV-2. So HIV-1 is worldwide. We find it uh, everywhere. HIV-2, we do find some cases in the Americas and in Europe, but they're usually people who've immigrated from a very small region of the world where HIV-2 um, can be found. Any questions so far, Cora? Mm, not really. Not really? Okay. So let's look at uh, HIV-2. All right, this small region of Africa is where we see almost all of the cases of HIV-2, right? So um, we can see this is the seroprevalence. And this was up to 1991. I couldn't find any newer data. There's not a lot of research being done on HIV-2. Um, so these are showing us the percentage, percentage of the population uh, that is positive for HIV-2 in these different areas of the world. 
So what's one of the interesting things is that um, HIV-1, we know, came from chimpanzees. HIV-2 came from this little guy right here, the Sudi Mangabe. Isn't he cute? Yeah. yeah. So they both came from primates. They both came from primates, right, because we're closely related to primates. So here's the Sudi Mangabe. He's super cute. Do you still think he's cute? No. <laughs> no, they have these huge teeth. They're kind of scary. All right. <clears throat> so, and this patched marked area here, that's the natural range of the Sudi Mangabees. Can you turn it back to the cute turn picture? Turn it back to the cute picture. Yeah, how's Thank that? You. Um, this is their natural range. So it came somewhere from here and then spread to the surrounding areas. Yeah? Any questions? <clears throat> Do you remember the question you asked last year? Yes. What was your question last year? Why is it only in that area? Yeah, so last year Cora asked, why is HIV-2 only in this small area while HIV-1 is became this worldwide pandemic? And her answer didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try again. All right, so the reason is this virus, HIV-2, one of the main reasons is it spreads much more slowly. It doesn't spread as easily as HIV-1. So HIV-1 itself doesn't spread very easily, but HIV-2 spreads even less easily. So the chances of one person infecting another with HIV-2 are much lower than a person infecting another person with HIV-1. Okay. That makes sense now? Yes. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> okay, scary monkey, okay. moving on. All right, there are, you may have heard the word when you've, learned anything about HIV, um, the word clades, or when we talk about HIV groups. So there are a number of different groups of HIV. For HIV-2, we actually have eight different groups. Um, they're named in alphabetical order. Uh, a and B are the most common ones that we see, and a lot of these others are more like we've seen one case with this, but it's genetically distinguishable from the other groups, so it gets its own group. Um, <clears throat> for HIV-1, we have groups M, N, O, and P. So M means main, main group. And this is the one that's gone worldwide. Um, and the vast majority of HIV cases are with group M. So then there was group O, I think was the next one discovered. And they named it O for outlier because it wasn't the same as M. Yeah, and then N was discovered, and it was named N, which stands for, because virologists are not clever, N stands for not M or not O, <laughs> which is kind of a dumb. Um, and then back in, oh, I can't remember oh, when this it was. it is easy to remember. It is easy to remember. And then back in the early 2000s, I believe it was, a fourth group of HIV-1 was found. And just to keep it in alphabetical order, they named it group P, which I guess, you know, kind of makes sense. Um, so over here, we're looking at a phylogenetic tree. <clears throat> here we have HIV uh, group M. This LB7 was a um, chimp that, um, came down with a disease very similar to HIV, and it was a simian immunodeficiency virus. And that champ, if I'm remembering correctly, actually lived on the um, site where Jane Goodall did her research. Is that why you asked me? Who That's why I asked you, and I couldn't remember her name. Yeah, I couldn't remember her name for some reason, but Cora remembered. Um, down here, we have uh, some of our group O, uh, CP here stands for chimpanzee, so they're also very similar to these chimpanzee genomes here. Up here we have uh, group N, and group P is not shown on here because it was discovered later. All right, so they're genetically pretty similar, um, but there are some, some differences here. Okay, so these are the groups, group M being the most prevalent of HIV-1. Whoops, no, it went too far. What is happening? <laughs> hmm, that won't stay. Why won't it stay? Um, okay, well, this little piece that keeps disappearing, look at it on the slides. Uh, it, <laughs> it tells us that there's a second breakdown. So we have our groups, group M. Within those groups, we break it down further into what can sometimes be called subgroups um, or what can be called clades. So you may have heard the word clades before. Uh, there are a number of different clades of HIV-1. These are in alphabetical order. 
the most common one um, in the Americas is clade B. So that'd be this one over here. Uh, the most common one worldwide is actually C. And I think it's like 48% of HIV infections worldwide are with clade C. But the one that we see most here in America is clade B. So group M, clade B. I don't know why it's not showing up on here. That's annoying. <clears throat> Moving are along. Are you calling me annoying? Or no, I'm annoying? calling the fact that the thing keeps disappearing. Okay. All right, so I have a question for you. Oh, yay. Okay, so think about this. What I want to know is, what do you think? How many total times has an HIV spillover occurred? So how many total times has um, this virus moved from monkeys or from, from primates, either from chimpanzees, those are not monkeys, they're red apes, or from sooty mangabees into people? So keep in mind, while you're thinking about this, that each of these groups here are genetically separable from the others. So like they're their own kind of grouping in a way. What do you think, Cora? Do you have any ideas? Um, 12. 12? Yes, 12 times. 12 separate occasions an HIV virus has made the leap from a primate to a human. And we know so far that it's 12 because each of these are genetically distinct. So each of our groups that we see here represents a different time that HIV has made the leap into humans. And that's pretty astounding. What's even more astounding is when you think about of all of these 12 times, only this one group M of HIV-1 has become a worldwide phenomenon. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. I think it's even crazier to, to think that this has happened 12 times and we didn't know about any of them until the 1980s. Hmm. All right. Yes, so Cora, thank you for helping. Um, I'll let you go on out and do something more fun than talking to me, okay? Okay. All right, bye. Goodbye, goodbye, all of this is goodbye. <laughs> Okay, so next up, we are going to look at HIV uh, replication cycle and various drug targets that we can use, um, or various uh, drug targets that are in use, excuse me, to mitigate and in, uh, inhibit HIV replication. So here's our HIV particle. And it attaches to cells, you guys probably already know this, um, by attaching to CD4 uh, and a co-receptor. So there are two different co-receptors. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. <clears throat> Attachment facilitates fusion of the viral envelope at the plasma membrane and release, so attachment and penetration here, um, into the cytoplasm. So this happens right at the plasma membrane. Once in the cytoplasm, our little capsid here comes apart, the virus is uncoded, and that single-stranded positive sense RNA genome is released into the cytoplasm. <clears throat> now here's where things get a little different. Here's where they're specific to retroviruses. This single-stranded piece of RNA gets transcribed into double-stranded DNA by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. This is a very slow process. It takes several hours for that reverse transcription to occur. After it does occur, the new double-stranded DNA genome is shipped into the nucleus of our cells, where it is integrated into the cellular genome. Right? That's how it maintains itself in the cellular genome. This bit of integrated viral DNA is called a provirus. So remember back when we talked about bacteriophages, we talked about the prophage was the bacteriophage DNA in the bacterial genome. Now a provirus, the viral DNA in the cell genome. Once this is here, we cannot get rid of it. That's why we don't have an effective treatment to just cure someone um, of HIV by giving them an antiviral. We cannot get rid of this without getting rid of all the cells that carry a copy of that gene. Okay. 
Once this integration step occurs, now our retrovirus can move on to biosynthesis. So we have transcription of viral messenger RNAs. They get exported and translated. They then get assembled and released from the cell by budding. Uh, once they're released, there's actually an extra step that has to occur outside of the cell where on the inside here, some cleavage of specific proteins by a viral protease is required to take it from this immature virus to a mature virus so that we can start this whole cycle over again. <clears throat> now, because we have studied HIV replication so well, because we have looked at all of the activities of its enzymes, we have a lot of drugs that target different parts of the viral replication cycle. So, we have some that target these very early steps, so fusion inhibitors that are going to prevent fusion at the plasma membrane, uh, entry inhibitors that can block interaction between those glycoproteins and the cellular receptors. We have a lot, we've already talked about some, like our um, nucleoside analogs that inhibit reverse transcriptase, like AZT, drugs that inhibit integration, um, and then protease inhibitors that prevent the maturation of this virus into its infectious form. If we prevent this, the, this immature virion is not um, infectious. It can't go on to infect new cells. So we're going to look at a few of these steps and how they work and how drugs can work against them. I keep hitting the wrong button today. Okay. <clears throat> so first, HIV attachment and penetration. Up here we have our viral envelope and this is our viral spike. So these are actually trimers. Um, they're composed of GP41, so that's sort of the matrix protein, GP120, which is our glycoprotein, our main glycoprotein. And so there are these variable loops on the bottom here. When this viral spike comes into contact with cellular CD4, which is its main receptor, this causes a conformational change in our um, viral spike protein. So notice these variable loops here go from kind of folded up toward the trimer, and then they flip out, they flip down, okay? So this conformational change has to occur in order for HIV to then bind the co-receptor. Right? So there are two co-receptors, CCR5 and CXCR4. Either of these will then bind there in those variable loops. And when that happens, a second important conformational change occurs. This second conformational change allows the fusion peptide, which is normally bundled up in here, hidden inside the trimer of proteins, it allows that to flip down and insert itself into the cellular membrane. When this happens, our two uh, membranes start to commingle because they both have these hydrophilic and hydrophobic portions. They will fuse, and we now have a pore uh, between our cells where um, the viral core, the capsid genome, can move into the cell. So we could target really any of these spots in attachment and penetration. So maybe we could block CD4, we could block co-receptor binding, we could block fusion from occurring. And there are quite a few drugs that target this. So you may have heard of some of these. Um, this particular one that I'm not even going to try to uh, say is a monoclonal antibody. When you see MAB at the end of something, it's a monoclonal antibody. So it would bind to these spikes and prevent them from binding to CD4. Uh, a number of things that prevent co-receptor binding um, in various different ways. Uh, one way is to stabilize the trimer so that the fusion peptide does not insert itself. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, fusion inhibitors. So this one in, in, fur, in fuvertide, that's hard to say, in fuvertide um, prevents membrane fusion from happening. Um, this was actually developed by a friend of mine's dad down at Tulane. Um, I worked with him a little bit uh, when I was a postdoc down there. <clears throat> oh yes, and he wrote that paper on um, 
SARS zoonoses that I linked on the very first slide. He's, he's the last author on that. Anyway, okay, so we can target attachment and penetration in several different ways by preventing binding the receptor, the co-receptor, or fusion of our two membranes. <clears throat> we can also target reverse transcriptase. We've already talked about this one a little bit, but there are a couple of different ways that we can inhibit this. The first is the use of uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which usually just get shortened to NRTIs. And so recall learning about AZT down here. I've put this back to remind us. Um, these nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors get incorporated into the growing strand of DNA that's being synthesized. Okay, so our bottom strand here, this is our HIV RNA genome template. Uh, this growing strand would be the first strand of DNA that gets made. So these NRTIs get incorporated, but because they lack a free 3 prime OH, we cannot have the addition of a new base here. So without that 3 prime OH, there's no way to link these two together. And so we wind up with elongation of the nascent DNA strand and inhibition of um, genome or of the um, formation of that double-stranded DNA intermediate. Without that double-stranded DNA intermediate, um, nothing else can happen, right? So again, that's how AZT works. Um, the second type of reverse transcriptase inhibitors are called NNRTIs, which again is a super clever, clever name because this stands for non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, right? So we've got nucleoside, NRTI, and non-nucleoside, NNRTI. So these work by physically binding to reverse transcriptase. So in this diagram, reverse transcriptase is this red pinwheel kind of looking thing. And our green NNRTI is going to bind directly to um, reverse transcriptase. So now it's changed shape. Uh, we can't add anything new in that pocket to carry out polymerization. So we get the same result in two different ways. This time we're not, we're not bringing in a new nucleoside. We're preventing any from being added because we've changed the shape of the polymer polymerase so that it doesn't work. Um, as you guys know, HIV mutates really quickly. And so <clears throat> we do over time develop uh, drug resistant viruses where these NNRTI binding pockets are changed. The drug can't bind in there anymore and they're not effective anymore. Okay, so we can inhibit, inhibit reverse transcriptase in two different ways. So recall that after reverse transcription, came integration, where that new viral double-stranded DNA gets integrated into the cellular genome and becomes a provirus. So this top part here is our uh, viral double-stranded DNA, and this purple and kind of salmon-colored part is host DNA. So the viral genome is going to get integrated uh, into the host target, and now we wind up with host DNA flanking our integrated proviral DNA. So we have host DNA on each side, proviral DNA in the middle. This proviral DNA is now the template for um, messenger RNA synthesis, along with synthesis of new viral RNA genomes. They then get packaged um, into new virions. So remember though that integrase is an enzyme. So think about how inhibitors to integrase might work. How could you, what could you do if you were designing a drug um, that would inhibit integration? And the answer is, maybe you paused it there to think about it, I don't know. The answer is, it's gonna work similar to those non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. It's gonna be some molecule that binds to the enzyme integrase, either in its active pocket or somewhere else where it causes a conformational change and prevents um, integration of the viral DNA into the host DNA, right? 
So something along those lines. <clears throat> okay. We have talked about the replication cycle. We've talked about drug targets. Let's move on and talk about the different phases of um, HIV uh, diseases, okay? So it can have a range of diseases. The first um, is what we call the acute phase. So that's immediately after, or you know, relatively soon after being infected. So if we're looking at our chart, over here we have our T cell count, our CD4 T cell count uh, in blue. Our time frame starts out in weeks and then moves on to years. And our red graph, our red line, is showing HIV RNA copies per mil of human plasma. <clears throat> All right, so our acute phase gives us anywhere between like a week to two week incubation period for our primary infection. And then we see pretty rapid and robust uh, replication of HIV where we can get a lot of viral RNA being um, found in the viral genome. We also see during this acute phase that our CD4 T cells pretty immediately start to decline, right? This uses CD4 as a receptor. T cells, macrophages are the main targets of the virus. Now, after this acute HIV syndrome has kind of gone away, our, our immune cells do kind of rebound and they control the virus for a while. Uh, and we have a low, what we call set point, right? So it comes down to some set amount of viral RNA that your body carries for a long time um, without necessarily experiencing any other symptoms. And we call this clinical latency. That's distinguishable from true viral latency because we are still getting a small amount of virus being made and we are still able to recover viral RNA from plasma. So while clinically our person seems fine, would have no um, true symptoms of HIV, they do still make a very low level of virus over time. Okay, we call this the chronic phase. Now after some amount of time, and it's usually somewhere between five and 10 years, this set point and viral load starts going back up. And the main reason it starts going back up is that at some point here, we start to lose those CD4 T cells, right? They're all being killed off by the virus. As their numbers start to plummet, <coughs> excuse me, the amount of uh, viral RNA that we uh, can recover from the blood goes up pretty rapidly. Um, and at, this, at some set point where we have too few CD4 T cells and we have a high enough amount of virus, this is when our person's gonna start experiencing and move from the chronic phase of HIV infection to AIDS, all right? Um, not everyone will progress to AIDS, particularly if they have treatment. Um, some people's body just naturally control the virus really well. We call them super controllers. Um, but if eventually, if left untreated, almost everyone will at some point progress to AIDS. Um, and then we see a lot of virus, a very low amount of T cells. And we also see a number of other things happening uh, in our patient as well. Okay, so before we move on to cellular tropism, let's take a little break. We've been talking for a while. You've been listening for a while about some pretty complicated stuff. So let's see, take a break today, and why don't you tell me what you've been doing um, for fun to try to you know, keep things somewhat exciting. Maybe you have been reading some books. Give me a book recommendation. Maybe you've been binge watching some new TV show or going back and watching your old favorite TV show again. Tell me, tell me what you've been watching um, or, or what you've been doing. If you've been knitting or sewing or I don't know, whatever you do for fun, tell me that. And then after you've taken a little break, come back and we'll talk about the next stuff, all right? Okay. HIV-1 cellular tropism. I believe you guys have already covered this in immunology, so hopefully this is just a review, but I'm gonna talk you through it as if you haven't ever heard it before. All right, you guys all know the main receptor of HIV is CD4, okay? So CD4, 
um, and then two different co-receptors, CCR5 or CXCR4. Now, depending on what co-receptors a particular strain of HIV uses, we can have the infection of some different cell types. And we refer to these strains as R5 if they primarily use CCR5. If that's their main co-receptor, they're going to infect memory CD4 T cells. All right, so this is going to impair our ability to fight off infections we've seen before. Um, some strains are um, dual tropic, so R5X4. They can use either co-receptor. They've garnered enough changes in their um, spike proteins to use either one, and they can infect both naive CD4 T cells and memory T cells. Um, and then our X4 strains, so these are our CXCR4 users, can also infect um, both naive and memory CD4 T cells. But recall that it's not just uh, CD4 T cells that can be infected. They can also, HIV can also infect macrophages. So you may be more um, familiar with this terminology of the M-tropic, T-tropic, or dual-tropic. So our M-tropic are those that use CCR5 as their co-receptor. And they can infect macrophages, which express both of those, and they can also in <clears throat> infect our CD4 T cells, uh, which are expressing CCR5. Dual tropic HIV, dual tropic HIV-1 can infect macrophages, primary T cells, and then also our um, more mature T cell lines that express CXCR4. And our T tropic, these are only infecting T cells. So these cannot express macrophages because they are X4, they use CXCR4 as their receptor and not CCR5. Now, one interesting thing that was discovered by accident, actually, is that there's a very, very small percentage of the population that has a mutation um, in CCR5. So it's called the CCR5 Delta 32 allele. It has a mutation um, in this particular allele. And these people are actually resistant to infection with HIV-1. So there's been um, some, oh gosh, if you remember like the CRISPR baby, from last, was that just last year, the CRISPR baby, where um, this sketchy doctor made a child that was HIV resistant. Um, it, I don't think it was actually this one, but they changed another allele that can be used um, for a receptor. Anyway, there's some talk about gene therapy uh, as a potential to um, create people who are more resistant to HIV infection. I don't know, kind of a long way off still. Okay, so we have these different kinds of tropism depending on which co-receptors uh, our HIV strains can use. And a person doesn't just have one of these strains in their body. It, it evolves over time to go from more specific to more generalized. All right, so if we were in class, I would ask you guys to turn to each other and discuss how your body is going to respond to secondary infections, so to other viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, if you're lacking macrophages, if you're lacking naive CD4 T cells, and if you're lacking memory CD4 T cells, right? So you guys can think about this on your own. If you're lacking any one of these, you're going to be much more likely to have secondary infections like bacterial pneumonia, um, uh, candidiasis, other um, diseases that we don't really see very often in people who have a full complement of these immune cells. So just the infection of these cells alone and the killing off of these cells alone has a very detrimental effect, effect but the virus produces a couple of proteins called NEF and VIF. And these proteins um, interfere with uh, CD4 and MHC1, so they can prevent MHC um, expression on the surface of our cells, so it can't be, uh, these infected cells can't be recognized. And they also decrease antiviral activity, so they decrease the production of our interferon pathways. Um, one of the other issues is that when T cells become activated, 
So if you have an infected T cell and you get some other infection, and those, those T cells that are harboring HIV, when they become activated to try to respond to something like pneumonia, this actually increases HIV viral replication too. So it's like a two-edged sword. Um, you want your immune system to work to fight off secondary infections, but in fighting off secondary infections, you're turning up HIV viral replication and you're making the whole situation worse. All right, so the main symptoms of acute HIV infection. Back, um, back when uh, we were first learning about HIV, when we were first beginning to understand what it is, how it works, it was discovered that the acute, the initial HIV infection is not necessarily something that most people would go to the doctor for unless they have some of the more serious um, symptoms. A, a lot of the symptoms are very um, like a common cold. So fever, headache, uh, swollen lymph nodes. Some people develop a skin rash, uh, sore muscles, nausea, vomiting, an enlarged spleen and liver. A lot of these are similar to what we've seen for like mono or even just um, influenza, aches and pains and chills, a little bit of nausea and vomiting. Not necessarily something that a person um, would go to uh, the doctor for. And some of the more severe cases of acute IV, HIV infection, people will develop ulcers and sores in their mouth or in their esophagus. Um, some can develop thrush immediately, but these are pretty rare. Um, generally, a person does not experience all of these symptoms, uh, and most of what they experience can be quite mild. It can even be asymptomatic. So back before there was screening, uh, for HIV, people would often miss these signs or they would write them off as they had a cold. And because these symptoms will resolve on their own um, without treatment in a few days to maybe a few weeks, um, initially uh, people missed that anything was wrong. Um, and even after we knew about HIV for the first decade or so after we knew about it, this a lot of people still went undiagnosed because they didn't prevent present with um, serious enough symptoms to even go to their doctor. So they wouldn't get tested for HIV until they were already in the chronic or even into the AIDS um, part of disease. <clears throat> so it can be really mild. It can be passed off as just a cold, passed off as the flu. So again, um, HIV moves from the acute phase to the chronic phase. Um, this chronic phase can last for years Usually it's between five and 10 years, eight-ish years when a person moves from this chronic phase into AIDS. During this chronic phase, right, we call it clinical latency because there's no symptoms, but it is not true latency. In fact, the body's making a whole lot of new virus, about 10 to the 10 new virions per day. So you're still making a lot of virus, but it takes a long time for that cumulative effect to result in AIDS. And not only are you producing a lot of new virus, but the virus is evolving. <clears throat> so most people begin their infection with an R5 virus. And over time, this evolves to the R5X4 type um, and the X4 type. So we're not just infecting macrophages and uh, naive CD4 T cells, we're infecting all of the other T cells as well. Okay, I'll get in a minute. <clears throat> um, so now that we have a lot of different types of treatment, we can do a lot to help our uh, patients who have uh, HIV infection, but it's not cheap, as you can imagine. The average monthly cost for antiretroviral therapy uh, is estimated as anywhere between $2,000 and $5,000. So imagine if you have to pay that out of pocket. Um, the lifetime cost as of 2015, it was estimated to be about $300,000. That's a lot of money. Uh, there are uh, plans to help people afford their drugs. So one of these is the ADAP, the, oh no, I can't remember what that stands for. Um, oh, look, it's right there, I wrote it next to it. The AIDS Drug Assistance Plan. 
This is available for people who have a very low annual income, so under about $22,000, or about four times below the annual poverty, or the federal poverty level. So you have to be really, really in need to um, get this sort of assistance. So to recap, acute HIV infection may be written off as a cold unless a person is experiencing something more severe like thrush, or ulcers uh, in their mouth or their esophagus. Chronic phase, clinical latency, no real symptoms, but a lot of virus production. Um, this is when a person would really need to start treatment and they would need to keep up with that treatment to keep from moving from the chronic phase into AIDS. So AIDS, uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, is not just, it's, it's not like, oh, a certain amount of time after an initial HIV infection, a person develops AIDS. And the case definition of AIDS is not anything real simple like there's this much virus in a person's body. It takes a number of things into account. So a person must have a low CD4 T cell count, uh, about less than or uh, around 200 CD4 T cells per mil of blood. Um, the normal is 500 to 1500 cells per mil. And they have to have at least one AIDS defining illness, AIDS defining conditions. So these can be things like uh, cytomegalovirus retinitis, so CMV infection in the eye, uh, PCP, pneumocystis urovetsi pneumonia, cryptospiridosis, which is a common intestinal pathogen, but if it's chronic, or it can be chronic in people with uh, depleted immune systems, um, invasive, cervic invasive cervical cancer, and some other rare invasive cancers as well. <clears throat> so it's a combination of a number of things that leads us to a diagnosis um, of AIDS. Now we can diagnose HIV um, like just an HIV positive individual, either in the acute or chronic phases, by looking for viral RNA or this particular viral protein called P24, which stands for protein 24, in the serum of our patient. If your patient is HIV positive, one thing that you may do is routinely screen them um, and look for the different strains of virus that they have. This is important for providing appropriate antiviral drugs. So you screen the genomes, you make sure you're providing ones that they're not, uh, providing antivirals that the um, virus is not resistant to yet. And that can change over time. <clears throat> A diagnosis of AIDS is made by our person being HIV positive. So we need to recover RNA or P24 from their serum. They need to have that low CD4 count, 200 cells per mil of blood. And that CD4 count needs to be less than 14% of total lymphocytes. So we need to have a low CD4 and we need to have a low overall amount of CD4 relative to other lymphocytes. And our patient must be experiencing some sort of AIDS-defining illnesses. And I know I don't need to tell you guys this, you guys already know, but being HIV positive is not the same thing as having AIDS. Right? There are a number of HIV positive individuals who uh, have their viremia so well controlled that we can't even detect viral RNA in their serum. It's to a level that's undetectable by our most sensitive um, techniques. And that means they can't transmit it to other people. That's how little they have in their body, which is kind of an amazing advancement from um, in, in just the past like 40 years. All right, so AIDS-defining illnesses. This is a short list. There are others, um, but these are ones that kind of fit with things that we've already talked about. So multiple or recurrent bacterial infections. If your patient is currently having, constantly having skin infections, uh, various types of pneumonia. Fungal infections of the lungs. So we've talked about some of these things before. Um, Coccidioide mycosis, uh, pneumocystis, uh, candidiasis, histoplasmosis that's disseminated through the body, <clears throat> right? And we learned in TBL that these are all pretty rare to begin with. Um, so we see them more often in uh, AIDS, uh, AIDS patients. 
Additionally, unusual cancers, cancers that we don't see in our normal healthy population. Kaposi sarcoma being one of them. We're gonna talk about that in a couple more slides. Also Burkitt lymphoma uh, or other rare lymphomas. And there's this other type of disease called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy that we only see or mostly only see in um, AIDS. Disseminated tuberculosis. If you remember way back to when we talked about tuberculosis, we really only see disseminated TB in the AIDS patients or in people who are otherwise immunosuppressed. We don't see disseminated TB in uh, people with a full complement of the immune system. Uh, and then another uh, weird one, toxoplasmosis of the brain. We'll probably talk about toxoplasma uh, when we talk about protozoans in a couple of weeks. Um, but we rarely see toxoplasmosis in um, non-AIDS patients. And then HIV-related encephalopathy. So uh, very much toward the end stage of AIDS, uh, HIV can progress to um, causing uh, brain irregularities similar to, but not quite like we see with Alzheimer's. Um, so it can cause um, a number of neurological uh, issues and neuropathologies as well. So when we think about treating HIV, either in the chronic stage or if we've progressed all the way to AIDS, the goal is to control the amount of virus that a person's body is making. Um, so we call this ART therapy, uh, active antiretroviral therapy. And this is going to be a generally a cocktail of different kind of drugs. So a person could be on any number of these types of drugs for some amount of time. Protease inhibitors, entry blockers, integrase inhibitors, nucleoside analogs. But generally when a person um, has taken these for a while and the virus is under control and is to undetectable levels, you can back off what they're given and kind of cut this down. And that's really good for um, making sure that your patient actually complies with taking their drugs, uh, taking their meds, because no one wants to take 10 pills a day. So what we can do now is a person can be on one or two different types of these drugs, and they don't even necessarily need to take them every day. The drugs can be taken once a week, um, and it will still maintain that reduced viral load. There are also a number of vaccines that an HIV positive person can be given. These are against specific strains. These are not protective vaccines. So we can't give these to uh, an HIV naive person and prevent HIV, but they act as a booster um, in the immune system of our HIV infected person to help them produce antibodies that might inhibit newly released viruses from infecting other cells, right? So they kind of stimulate the production of um, immunoglobulins or put more cells in the antiviral state, but they're not protective vaccines. And of course, the biggest, the most important, the thing that's helped us get uh, HIV, the spread of HIV under control here in the US is education. Um, education of how HIV is spread, of what it does. Uh, in particular, right, you guys know this, safe sexual practices. Um, but one of the things that we don't often think about are needle exchange programs, right? We tend to focus more on uh, the safe sexual practices because HIV is primarily spread um, through sexual intercourse, but it is a bloodborne pathogen. Um, so things like reusing or sharing needles uh, is another place where HIV can be picked up. So I wanna tell you a story. You guys know I love stories by now. Scott County, Indiana, this little red county down here at the bottom of Indiana, very rural part of the Midwest. <clears throat> um, in 2015, this tiny little county had 30 new cases of HIV in February of that year, which was pretty astounding to begin with because there's generally not a lot of cases of HIV in rural areas. By mid-March, there were 55 new cases of HIV. 
And by February of the following year, so uh, one full year later, um, there were 190 cases in this one county that had been um, identified. By the time this outbreak was under control, there were 235 cases total in a town of 4,100 people. So if we do the math, that comes down to a prevalence of six cases per 100 residents in this one small town. So the question when this started happening was why? Why are we seeing this huge increase in HIV in an area where we've never really seen HIV before? So if you think back to 2015, 2016, this was really up at the, the height, the beginning of the opioid epidemic. And there were, and the Midwest in particular got hit really hard by the opioid, opioid epidemic. And a lot of people were injecting um, opioid drugs like this one here. Uh, and that's what was happening here in Scott County. So residents were injecting opioids and in the 2000 and uh, late 2014 or, or early 2015, the then governor of Indiana had done away with all needle exchange programs. So needle exchange programs are where users can come, return their used needles and get clean needles. Uh, a lot of people argued that this was just um, enabling. This was making it easier for users to use drugs. Uh, but things like needle exchange programs have an important part in public health because once that was done away with, we had the largest outbreak of HIV in a rural community that the U.S. has ever seen since we first got this whole um, epidemic under control. So um, eventually the state did reinstate needle exchange programs uh, and those numbers were under control and the outbreak ended. So um, if you're interested, you can go look up who the governor of Indiana was in 2015, 2016, and figure out what it is he's in charge of right now. Just, you know. All right, moving on. Antiviral resistance. We all know, we've all heard that HIV is really, really good at developing resistance to antivirals. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Remember, when we talk about antiviral resistance, we are talking about mutation. <clears throat> Viruses don't really undergo conjugation or transformation, so the basis of antiviral resistance is just mutation of the viral genome. <clears throat> HIV is the fastest mutating entity we know of um, for a lot of reasons. So reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that converts the viral RNA to DNA, does not proofread. So if it makes an error, if it incorporates an erroneous base, it just keeps that error. And it makes an error in one in about every 17,000 to 30,000 new nucleotides added. All right, so that's, that's fairly, you know, that, that's pretty bad. That's a high mutation rate. Now, once integrated, that provirus gets passed on from cell to cell as our own DNA replicates. So host DNA polymerase replicates that provirus and spreads it on. Our polymerase proofreads, right? You guys know this, our polymerase, if it makes an error, it will fix that base before it moves on to the next one. And it misses a few here and there, but look, this is the error rate for our polymerase. One in 10 to the seventh to one in 10 to the ninth nucleotides. So compare that up here to one in 17,000 to one in 30,000. This is much more error prone. So reverse transcriptase is making quite a few mutations that then goes into the provirus. That already mutated provirus may accumulate a few more mutations over time. And then that provirus is used as the template to make new viral genomes that go into the next generation of released viruses that go on to infect new cells. The new RNA genomes are made by RNA polymerase. And this is our RNA polymerase, the same one that makes our messenger RNAs, makes those new RNA genomes that get packaged and put into new viruses. This polymerase does not proofread, and it makes a lot of errors. Uh, the range is anywhere from one in 1,000 nucleotides added to one in 100,000 nucleotides added. 
So if we add up all of these chances for error by all three of these different polymerases, we wind up with a really high error rate in HIV. And so it can very quickly um, develop resistance to the cohort of drugs that it's being given. So that's why uh, if you are caring for an HIV infected patient, they need to uh, occasionally go in and have the types of viruses, the, gen the genotypes of virus in their body checked. So you can make sure that they haven't developed a mutation that makes them resistant to whatever particular drug they're being given. And you can make sure you're maintaining that decreased viral load. So this is the big question. Where do we stand now? Are we ever going to have an antiviral that gets rid of the provirus from our cells? No, not without killing all the cells that have the virus. Are we ever going to come up with a drug that completely prevents viral replication? Probably not. So the best way that we can get rid of HIV would be to come up with a vaccine. There have been a lot of trials for vaccines over time. There was one that seemed really, really promising that was started about two years ago. Um, and as I was updating information for this year's HIV lecture, I saw this very sad headline. Um, there was an experimental HIV vaccine that looked promising. It turned out to be ineffective at preventing HIV and the um, trial was actually ended early. There weren't any safety concerns. It didn't seem like there were any side effects. Um, but of, of the two cohorts, those who received the vaccine and those who received a placebo, there were 129 new HIV cases among those who received the actual vaccine and 123 among placebo recipients. So no efficacy at all. Uh, and this link here will take you to that NIH report if you're interested in looking it over. So right now we still don't have a vaccine. We have some really good drugs that can help people control the viral load. Um, we, can, we have drugs we can deliver uh, prophylactically to uh, sexual partners of HIV infected individuals. And those work really well at preventing um, transfer of, of the disease, particularly if the HIV positive person has very, very low or undetectable um, viral loads. So we've come a long way. We can control it really well. Uh, but as of now, we still cannot get rid of it, and we still don't have a vaccine for it. Maybe one day we will be there, and that would be awesome. So let's talk for just a couple of slides about Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes viruses. We've talked about the other herpes viruses. This one is the rare one that we, we consider one of those AIDS-defining illnesses. There's not really one anyone else who comes up with this. It's one of those very, very rare cancers. Um, it's called Kaposi's sarcoma-associated herpes virus because we can isolate this virus from 100% of Kaposi's sarcoma cases. Uh, it is transmitted by saliva, and the virus uh, infects the oral epithelium. So it infects epithelial cells, much like the herpes simplex viruses. Um, and it can also infect B cells. So when it infects B cells, it can produce a couple of diseases called primary effusion lymphoma. Um, and we can see this in the pleural cavity. <clears throat> uh, we can, it, it can cause a disease called multicentric Castleman disease. And it's uh, evident clinically by these raised lesions on this patient's skin and by these tumors that we can see here uh, in the oral epithelium, right? So a couple of different clinical presentations of Kaposi's sarcoma. And again, we only, uh, we only see this in the US in uh, AIDS patients. Diagnosis of this can be kind of hard. We don't really have tests with great sensitivity. They're all very low sensitivity tests. You could do real-time PCR to look for a uh, viral genome, but usually it's based on clinical symptoms. So that rash, the uh, tumor looking things in the oral epithelium, and does your patient have AIDS? There are some treatment options uh, for this virus. So same as what we see for uh, the herpes simplex virus, we can give gancyclovir. Uh, this can help control lytic infection. 
um, and can prevent you know, reactivation if our patient goes into latency. But again, there's no treatment for those latently infected cells. We cannot get rid of herpes viruses just like we cannot get rid of uh, HIV. So we can treat it in the lytic stage, try to prevent it from re-entering the lytic stage, but we can't get rid of latently infected cells. And then of course, treat uh, the cancers as needed. Treat them with the appropriate um, radiation or chemotherapeutics, all right? Okay, guys, that is all uh, that we have for today. I hope you kind of enjoyed learning a little bit about the history of HIV, where it came from, how many times spillovers happened, and looking really particularly at how it does what it does, how we treat it, um, and what all these drugs work. Um, so this is it. Just this one lecture for this week, guys, and I will post the next one um, next week. Have a good week, you guys. Bye.